Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Gantry Virtual Public Meeting for the LBMM Lawrence to Bryn Mawr Modernization Project Area. I am Latrice Phillips Brown, Government and Community Relations Liaison, and a part of the outreach team for the CTA RPM Red Purple Modernization Project. I would like to take a moment to thank 46th Ward Alderman James Kappelman and 48th Ward Alderman Harry Osterman and their staff for their contributions and continued support of the RPM project. I would like to also thank each and every one of you for joining us this evening to learn more about the newest member of the RPM team, the Gantry. I'm gonna pause right here and turn it over to 48th Ward Alderman Harry Osterman for a few remarks. Alderman Osterman. Thank you, Latrice. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining the call tonight. Um, the first six months of this project have um, uh, been significant. There's been a lot of work done. Uh, I appreciate the patience from all the residents in the neighborhood, whether you live along the red line or you've been impacted by the traffic. I think uh, the, set, the next part of this project uh, you're going to hear about tonight, which is the gantry, which is a very unique, uh, significant part of this project that will help make this project move along quicker. Um, so we, again, appreciate your patience with this project um, and look forward to questions that you have tonight. Feel free to reach out to us at the CTA um, as we move through this project. So uh, stay safe, get vaccinated and buy local. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Osman. Before we get started, I'm going to explain how the virtual meeting will work. This meeting is being recorded and will be streaming live on Facebook. Live sign language and closed captioning is provided on the screen. The recording of this meeting will be translated into Chinese, Vietnamese, and Spanish, and will be posted to the RPM website. We will first have a presentation. Following the presentation, we will have a 15 minute question and answer session. Due to the large attendance of tonight's meeting and in an effort to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to ask any questions they may have, we are requesting that all questions be submitted by clicking the small Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing your question into the box. You will be able to ask questions throughout the entire meeting and questions will be addressed during the Q&A at the end of the meeting. If your question is not answered during the Q&A, don't worry. We will post a full Q&A on our website following the meeting. I'm going to ask that all speakers mute their mics when not speaking to limit the amount of background noise. Now let's get started. Next slide. The gantry will soon be making its debut in the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr project area. It will be used to construct the new track structure the gantry is 285 feet long, which is longer than a 747 airplane and almost as long as a football, football field, I'm sorry. Next slide. Tonight's agenda will cover the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr Modernization Project Overview, Project Updates, Construction Method for the Gantry System, and Community Impacts. Next slide. Lawrence to Bryn Mawr Modernization Project Overview. Next slide. Rebuild Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn, and Bryn Mawr. As you all know, these four stations, the tracks and embankment are all over a hundred years old. Once this project is complete, Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn, and Bryn Mawr will be 21st century modern and fully accessible stations with both escalators and elevators, making these stations accessible to all. During construction, we will also rebuild and rehabilitate the track and embankment structures. Now let's take a look at the future views of the stations. Next slide. Rimar Station. This slide shows a future view of the main station house. As you can see, the columns have been removed, providing a clear span 
and open view of the station. I would like to note that the main station house at Bryn Mawr will flip to the north side of the street and there will also be an entrance to the station at Hollywood. Next slide. Berwyn Station. Just like Bryn Mawr, the area underneath the track is open with the astral lighting providing an increase of safety and security. An additional bike, bike parking has been provided. Next slide. Argyle Station. Along with the lighting and additional bike racks, CTA and wash floor worked closely with the neighborhood stakeholders to make sure that this station design was reflected, the character, I'm sorry, that the station's design reflected the characteristics of the community. Next slide. Lawrence Station. This slide shows a view of the station house and auxiliary exit. Just like Bremar, the station house at Lawrence will flip to the north side of the street and the auxiliary exit will flip to the south side of the street. As you can see from this slide, every effort was made to open the street and provide a clear view of the well-lit station with additional bike parking. Next slide. Lawrence to Bremar project timeline. Stage A construction began this year in spring of 2021 and will continue until winter 2022. At that time, stage B will begin and will continue until winter 2024. Next slide. Construction in the Lawrence to Bremar project area has been divided into two stages. Stage A, which is the east side of the tracks and stage B, which is the west side of the tracks. By dividing the construction into two stages, it allows us to maintain and continue to run CCA service on one side of the tracks while construction is taking place on the other side. Currently, we are running CCA service on the west side of the tracks and construction is taking place on the east side of the tracks. I will now turn it over to Mikhail Williams, CCA project manager. Good evening. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing for the past few months since the start of stage A. You can go to the next slide. So the main activities that we've been focusing on is demolition of the old structure, the demolition of the signal system infrastructure, soil stabilization activities, installation of deep foundations and substructure. We've also been fabricating precast track structure segments offsite. And the main two reasons for approaching this in this way is so that we can optimize our schedule. While we're working on foundations on site, we can work it with the subsequent substructure off site. It also allows us to reduce the equipment that is needed on site and the material that is needed on site, which overall reduces our community impacts. Next slide. So to date, we have completed the demolition of a little bit less than two miles of track work along with the associated signal system. We've also completed the demolition of our two out of service station houses at Berwyn and Lawrence. And we're also about 90% complete working on installing our engineered barrier. Now the engineered barrier serves two main purposes. It provides a physical separation between the Western in-service tracks and the Eastern work zone. The majority of the barrier above ground is supported below ground by sheet piles. And that's an integral part of our earth retention system, which allows us to go into soil excavation. Next slide. So currently we are working on uh, structure demolition and excavation, um, working in various locations from the north side of the job to the south side of the job. As you saw in the previous renderings that were pre presented by Latrice, the new structure is elevated. So that requires us to do de demolition of various different viaducts at the cross streets. Currently, we have completed nine out of 11 viaduct demolitions. And we're also working on the retaining wall demolition and embankment. Now, for the most part, the retaining wall will stay in place, but we will be selective demoing mostly the top of the retaining walls and the locations where the contractor will install access ramps at the cross streets. 
These access ramps allow for the contractor to mobilize equipment, material, and personnel to track level. Next slide. So now that we have a large portion of our demolition and earth retention activities completed, we're able to start our foundation work and our substructure work. Currently, we've completed six out of 81 drill shafts and two out of 80 columns required for stage A. Now, just to give you a magnitude of what those drill shafts include, each drill shaft ranges from about six and a half feet to a little over seven feet in diameter, and they're drilled to a depth of over 70 feet. Next slide. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Kevin Butch from Wash Floor, and he's gonna go into um, the details on how we're gonna be installing our track structure set segments via the gantry system. Good evening, thanks a lot, Mikhail. So as Mikhail mentioned, my name is Kevin Bush. I'm the project manager over the bridge structure at the Lawrence Springmore Modernization. In the background here, there's a picture of an actual precast segment that's being utilized for this project. If you would, please advance to the next slide. Now in the background here, this is another picture taken at our precaster of several segments that have been cast to date. Once complete, the new structure will actually consist of 1,555 precast segments. As Mikhail said, these are all being prefabricated off-site, which brings a lot of the work, keeps a lot of the work away from the project site, which helps reduce some of the impacts at the project. Um, once complete, the segments will be supported by concrete columns and a system of tension steel cables inside of the segments, similar to an internal suspension bridge. You won't be able to see those, but that's what structurally supports the bridge and allows for future maintenance to occur inside of the, inside of the uh, segmental box structure. Next slide, please. This picture is taken at the precast yard in Morris, Illinois. Utility concrete products are the, the team actually prefabricating the segments. In the bottom of the, se the concrete segment there, you can see all the circles. That's where all the steel cables run longitudinally through the box that actually support the structure. Once complete, each segment is approximately 27 and a half feet wide, nine feet tall, and roughly uh, range from about eight feet to 11 feet in length. Next slide, please. In this picture, you can see a lot of the segments in the background that are being stored at UCP, our, pre, our precaster. The yellow crane is called a, it's a different type of gantry. This is what we'll be using at the job site to actually unload the segments when they come in from Morris and in order to place them up on the gantry to be able to wreck the bridge. Next slide, please. So the, what is a gantry? The gantry is a custom built piece of mobile equipment designed to put the track segments into place. We say it's custom built. This particular piece of equipment is custom. It's unique to this project. The, it, there's been very similar trusses or gantries that have been used on other projects, but this particular gantry was designed and fabricated for this particular job. The assembly has currently started at Ardmore. We're currently putting up the temporary supports that will support the gantry. And as soon as next week, we'll be starting to see some of the, the white pieces that you see in the background and we'll start assembling the gantry. Once the gantry is assembled, we will start at Ardmore and we'll continue south towards Leland. So everything goes from north to south and we'll erect the bridge um, starting here in the fall. Next slide, please. If you would play the video here. Let's see. There we go. So first off, we have to thank YouTube for this video, but this particular gantry that you see is being used in Montreal. It is actually manufactured, designed and manufactured by the same supplier that we are using for this project. As you can see, the gantry takes the segments from down below and erects them overhead. Once a, once a particular span is complete, the, the gantry will launch to the next span and will continue the process. This helps reduce a lot of the impacts to the community, to the cross streets, to the alley, because we're able to bring in the prefabricated sections and build everything from above. Right now you can see they're aligning the segments. So once they get, once they're all hung, we'll align them, install the steel cables that I was talking about earlier. And then at that point in time, once those cables are installed and stressed, the span is self-supporting. 
the gantry can lower that span down under the permanent uh, concrete piers, and then the gantry will launch forward and we'll repeat the process. Next slide, please. This is a picture taken at the red purple bypass of the exist of the of the structure that we just were in the process of building right now. And the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr modernization, the concept is very similar from the and on top of the deck. Here you can see there's one track for a single train. At Lawrence to Bryn Mawr, we'll have each box girder will have will support two trains. We'll also have the precast noise barriers that you can see on the side, which helps eliminate or reduce the noise because it deflects it upward. Next slide, please. Once complete, this is uh, what a typical cross section will look like. So as Mikhail and Latrice have mentioned, stage A would be on the right hand of the picture. Um, those would be the northbound trains. On the left hand side of the picture would be the stage B, the southbound trains. The existing gravity wall, you can see there's some modifications to it, but it will, it will uh, by and large be in existence at the, at the completion of construction. We'll enclose the area and those ramps that we're using right now for access won't be seen anymore. Next slide, please. So some of the benefits to uh, the area when we use a technology like this to build uh, this type of a superstructure. So first, there's less impacts in the neighborhood because we're building the track support pieces off site. When those pieces of concrete come to the job site, they've already had time to cure and they are ready to, be, to go into service right away. That allows us to complete the construction a lot faster. We can also work within the confined space in the dense urban environment to the work site. Everybody who's been anywhere near this project understands how dense and how, how, much, how little real estate there really is to work. So by developing a, a piece of equipment, designing a piece of equipment that can actually operate within the confines of the proposed structure, we don't have to, we're able to operate without um, impacting any of the adjacent structures that are already in existence. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna talk about some of the impacts to the community. Next slide. So first off, we'll talk about the streets. So at the various side streets running through the, through the project, we will be closing them down as we erect the bridge over the cross streets. So some of the side streets between Ardmore, Catalpa, Balmoral, Argyle, Winona, and Ainsley would be short-term closures. Um, some of the major streets will be, again, short-term closures over the weekend. Um, and the three that you can see that are in bold, Ardmore, Balmoral, and Ainsley are all um, areas that we're going to be hoisting segments. So that's where we're going to be delivering the segments. And then from those cross streets, the segments come up onto the bridge and we deliver them to the gantry as the gantry continues to work south. Next slide, please. Also, there are some impacts to the alleys. Roll enclosures of the alleys behind Winthrop Avenue and cross streets as the gantry moves from north to south. Um, I will say that there, these impacts are minimal. Um, but there will be impacts to the residents' access to private garages and parking spots while the gantry is adjacent to the property. There will be alternative parking for affected residents and garbage and recycling pickup will continue without interruption. As the gantry is working from north to south, all of, almost all of the equipment will be elevated up on top of the superstructure. So the direct impact will only be to the building that's a, directly adjacent to the section of bridge that's being erected at that point in time. So both ends, typically both ends of the alley will be open and will only be shutting down certain parts of the alley during the superstructure construction. Next slide, please. Once we're complete on stage A, which is the Eastern box, we'll be repeating the process on stage B. The impacts are going to be similar. A lot of, we're gonna be crossing all of the same cross streets. However, all of the operations will be focused on the west side. So the alley, the impacts to the alleys and the residents on the east side will not be significant. Next slide, please. Next, I'm gonna turn it back over to Latrice. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. We are aware that consistent and effective communication and outreach is crucial for this project. So we have several ways we would communicate with the community. We will continue to have virtual town halls and smaller community meetings. Our monthly virtual office hours is ongoing. So please submit your project related questions and the RPM team will provide a response. We will be hosting community watch parties. We will continue to post, distribute and e-blast our construction activity notices. 
We will provide construction project updates for residents, service alerts for customers, and we will also communicate via social media and our website. Next slide. On the screen, you can see that we have multiple ways for you to stay informed about the RPM project. You can also stop by the RPM community office, which is located at 5137 North Broadway. RPM staff is there on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Next slide. Please feel free to follow us at CTA RPM on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This concludes the presentation portion of the meeting. Before we move on to the Q&A session, our team wants to take a moment to thank everyone in this meeting, especially all of the residents for your patience doing this work. It's a lot, we understand. We also thank the small businesses in the project area for their patience, and we will continue to work hard to promote them through our RPM Open for Business program. Please don't forget to support your local businesses. Our team is doing this every day. We will now move on to the question and answer portion of the meeting. I'm going to ask that all the panelists turn on your cameras. Um, I will introduce the panelists that were not a part of the presentation. We have Jeff Wilson, Director of Government and Community Relations for CCA. Tammy Chase, Director of Media and Communications for CTA. Rob Cheeseman, Lawrence to bring my modernization, construction manager for Walsh Floor. And Marcy Jensen, Communication and Public Outreach Support Manager for Walsh Floor. Just a quick reminder on how to ask questions. You can ask questions by clicking the small Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing your question into the box. If your question is not answered during the Q&A, don't worry. We will post a full Q&A on our website after the meeting. Okay. Leave the first question will be for Rob Cheeseman. Why was Ardmore chosen as the staging location for this work? Um, that's a good question. Um, as Kevin mentioned, there are a few significant staging locations, uh, Ardmore being the first, uh, and then the next would be Balmoral and Ainsley. And those are three of the uh, several allowable staging locations based on CDOT requests and, and the contract. So other, other streets such as Hollywood and Bryn Mawr were not allowed to close for a significant amount of time simply because of the impact it would have on the community traffic. So that's why Ardmore is first. And as you see with the launching gantry, as Kevin showed, it starts at one end and goes to the other. So when, once uh, once we're done at Ardmore, we'll be moving to Balmoral next. Thanks, Rob. The next question will be for Kevin. Can all work, including the gantry assembly equipment, move in, take place during designated work hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday? That's also a good question. Uh, nearly all of the work will take place during the daytime hours when we are crossing some of the major streets and we have a, a 54 hour weekend outage, we will be forced to do some of that work overnight. Um, one thing that I think is, is really important to understand, this gantry is powered by an electrical generator and the actual noise produced by the generator is very, it, it's one of the quietest pieces of equipment that we have on the job site. So I think that's worth understanding, but typically the work will proceed during the day. Thank you, Kevin. The next question will be for Mikhail. What can you do to minimize the noise generated by construction vehicles backing in from Sheridan? Well, one of the main um, things that we can do um, while minimizing impacts to the community is our priority. We wanna make sure that we have the work occur in a safe way. So we make sure that we coordinate with the contractors, specifically Rob and Kevin, and talk through all of the equipment moves and the closures that they have. 
For the most part, um, they do use busy streets such as Sheridan and Broadway. Um, and we make sure that we review um, their closures when they have major pieces of uh, material and equipment coming into the site. And we make sure that it doesn't present an undue uh, burden onto the community. So in doing that, that allows us to restrict the noise to um, a time period, which would be either seven to three, seven to 7 p.m. Um, or if we have to do work overnight, um, we generally uh, e-blast that out to the community so that they are aware if there are impacts, they can plan for them. Okay, Mikhail, I have a follow-up question for you. Can you disable the vehicle's backup alarm since they are always accompanied by flaggers? Um, like I said before, um, our main focus is to minimize impacts to the community, but our priority is to make sure that everything occurs in a safe way. So um, disabling those alarms would present a security or a safety hazard to our workers and to the community. So we want to make sure that we do everything in a safe way, even though it may be a little bit of a nuisance to the community. The first priority is to make sure that everyone impacted our workers, um, our construction activities and the community um, is protected in a safe way. Thank you, Mikhail. The next question is for Tammy Chase. How are businesses being supported with the Open for Business campaign? Can you all hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All right, sorry about that. Um, so typically with all major construction projects, CTA does support local businesses, typically posting signs or banners, um, you know, letting people know that businesses are still opening uh, or still open. Um, with the RPM project, just because there were hundreds of businesses potentially affected by our project in the project footprint, we created the RPM Open for Business program in late 2020. Um, that includes um, signage, uh, social media, um, uh, creating, a, we've just created a website on within the transitchicago.com website that is um, all about local businesses and the local communities, including a business directory. And we're also, uh, we have been uh, rolling out a series of videos that feature individual businesses um, within the project area, allowing the business owners to tell their story and what makes them um, special. We do this um, in very close uh, cooperation with the local chambers of commerce, the businesses themselves, as well as local elected officials, including um, Alderman Kappelman and Alderman Osterman. Um, it's, it's, it's a great partnership and we continue to look for new ways that we can celebrate businesses as well as encourage people to go to the businesses, um, shop there, eat there, play there. Thanks, Sammy. The next question is, will this presentation be available for viewing later? I can take that um, question. Yes, um, a copy of the presentation will be posted to the RPM website following the meeting. The next question is, who is the contact person to talk about dispersal of parcels of land freed up by the project? So for that question, you can contact Jeff Wilson. His email is jwilson at transitchicago.com. The next question is for Mikhail. Will we see how the platforms will be configured? Yes, in regards to, well, either way it goes, we're gonna present to the community um, what the boarding configuration will be. We also have um, standards as far as community and customer information. Um, anytime we change different boarding configurations, we have to give notice of at least two weeks. So we try to make sure that we message that um, on social media, um, also at every station, particularly for the new stations or the stage B stations, we will present that to the community so that everyone is aware um, of where you would be able to board the trains and where the new platforms will be. Um, in addition to just having, you know, uh, signage on site. Um, so we make sure that we take an in-depth look and a review at all of the signage required and wayfinding so that the community and our customers are aware of where they can board trains. Thank you. Um, the next question will be for Rob. Um, it says suspension bridges. 
cable, will cables end up anchored on either side of the bridge? And where will the cables be anchored in this project? I'll hand that one off to Kevin. He's much smarter on this bridge than I am. Okay. I wouldn't say smarter, but but I can tell you the post tensioning cables that run through the box, they're actually anchored at the pier segment, which is the end of each span. So directly above the concrete pier that's supporting the bridge, there's a series of anchors um, embedded in the concrete right there. And that's where the steel terminates and that's what transfers all the load into the structure to keep it supporting. Um, each particular span, so in between each pier, it's there's no continuous span, so everything um, ends at each pier and then starts over with the next span. Okay. The next question is for Jeff Wilson. Is there an opportunity to provide public parking underneath the tracks? Uh, good evening, everybody. So we're actually working very closely with the Alderman's office as well as the surrounding community to get input about how they'd like to activate some of the open space that's going to be post-construction. So we welcome feedback. Uh, we welcome any kind of ideas and we work through the Alderman's office. So any suggestions you have should be submitted to both us and uh, Alderman, either Kappelman's office or Alderman Oshman's office, depending on uh, what your interest, what, where the interest is. So thank you. Next question, I'm gonna send it over to Rob. Why are walls being built under the new tracks when the project is finished? versus turning that newly available space for public use. Kind of dovetails with the uh, parking question there, but the, uh, the, the reason to uh, put the walls up is uh, for security, um, uh, just to keep uh, stuff from getting piled up, control trash, that kind of thing. Uh, so the footprint under this structure doesn't look all that different from what it is right now, other than that, the cross streets where it'll be much wider. But uh, that's the main reason I believe is uh, security and the CTA can feel free to weigh in if there's anything there else on the why the walls are going up. Yeah, mainly I would say uh, for security, just to piggyback on uh, your comments, Rob. And then also we have um, a regiment of maintenance of our structure to make sure that it's safe and it's operating the way that it should be. So that area underneath the structure primarily, um, I shouldn't say primarily, but for the most part will be used for maintenance. Um, so that we can make sure that the structure is sound and it's performing the way that it should. So security and maintenance are two major factors. Okay. When the project is finished, is there any sound control with the new tracks that will make the CTA trains sound less and across the adjacent community? Kevin? I was hoping there's a sound engineer on here. <laughs> At the end of construction, I mentioned in the picture uh, that showed the section of bridge over at the red purple bypass, we'll have precast noise barriers that are erected on both sides. And those noise barriers, they help deflect the sound up, which, um, which helps to the, the end user down the street level or in the adjacent buildings. Um, the other thing that's important to note, this rail is continuously welded rail. Um, so there's not a lot of joints um, just like there is on a typical ballasted track. Um, and then with the closed deck structure, uh, you got solid concrete from almost the very uh, north end to the very south end. So all of those um, items really do help reduce the noise um, from the trains. Thank you. Next question is for Rob. Will the clearance of the underpass be higher than it is today? What is the new clearance? Yeah, the, the clearance on all the viaducts were demolishing. Um, you know, some of them are just over 11 feet right now, but the minimum will be 14 foot six. So more than enough for standard trucking, um, which is good. So we won't have trucks getting stuck under the bridges anymore when they're done. Uh, but uh, the minimum right now is uh, 14 foot six. Um, the next question will be for Kevin. Where do all the dump trucks take all the rubble? Hmm. All the rubble goes off site to various landfills that we have approval with to um, dispose of that material. So everything is taken off site. Okay. And back to Rob. What is being done to repair the damage to the roads used by the heavy construction equipment and added rerouted traffic? So Temporarily, we'll be patching sidewalks and roads as necessary as the, as the heavy equipment goes by. 
Um, there are plans at the end of stage B. So as the stations are getting built uh, in 2023 and 24, where we do have full uh, sections of reconstruction to repair damages um, and uh, tie in the new sidewalks to the existing, um, as well as enhance the, the security of all the streets. The next question is for Tammy. After this project is complete, will construction proceed with the stations going north? So future phases of RPM um, are still being determined. Um, as we've said all along that this is a multi-phase project. So which stations uh, will be included in the next phase is still um, to be determined and will be announced to the community um, when we do have a, a decision on that. Okay. The next question is for Kevin. Um, how will the segments be delivered and how many can you install in a day? Number and distance. Good question. So the segments will be delivered via um, a normal tractor trailer. It'll have a, a low boy trailer and we'll deliver them to the three cross streets that we had previously discussed, Ardmore, Balmoral and um, Ainsley. Once the segments get to the bridge, we'll, we'll lift them, we'll hoist them from street level, put them up on the new bridge, and then they will deliver them to the gantry. Um, typically, we will be delivering on average six segments per day. However, our hauler and our precast are able to load out up to 12 per day so that we could get an entire span, which is the longest spans have 12 segments. So that would be the maximum that would ever come in in one day. The next question is for Mikhail. How will trains operate? Are you demoing one side, removing existing tracks on one side, and then operating both north and southbound trains on one set of tracks? Yes, so the benefit to this area is that we have the real estate of four different tracks. So we split the project into stage A and stage B. Stage A is the east side, um, which includes two tracks, and then the west side, which is stage B, includes two tracks. Currently, we're operating on the western two tracks, northbound and southbound red and purple line trains. Um, once we finish stage A and we test all the new tracks on the east side, we will then revert uh, trains to the new eastern tracks and then repair the western tracks. The next question is for Jeff. Why have the CTA automated rail announcements not yet updated to reflect which side doors open? On what side? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't believe we were aware of that, but um, thank you for bringing that to our attention. I will reach out to um, CTA rail operations and get an answer for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is, go back to Kevin about the sound walls. So, so the question about the sound was answered for lower buildings, but what about the taller buildings like the park tower? So all three of those items that I had mentioned, the, the closed deck structure, the continuously welded rail and the noise barrier all contribute to less sound um, getting to the end user. So again, that sound is deflected straight up from those precast noise walls. So I think the, the net, the end result for everybody is it's gonna be, it's gonna be quieter than the existing structure. Okay. The next question, um, go back to you, Kevin. Since a majority of the construction is precast concrete construction, will there be any ornamental designs put in the form work so that the new work looks beautiful as well as functional? Yes, so actually on the precast noise barrier, there is a um, intricate uh, pattern on the uh, uh, panels, especially over the cross streets. Each cross street has their own pattern. Um, and then there's a, a typical pattern between the cross streets. Then at the down below, um, at the end of the day, the we call them screen walls, but the walls that enclose the existing embankment, um, those also have a form liner pattern. So there will be some architectural um, form liner included on, on all of that precast. Okay, the next question is for Rob. Will the width of the alley from homeowners garages to the new wall remain the same? Uh, generally, yes. The uh, new screen wall uh, goes up in the same relative location as the existing embankment. Um, at, at the uh, bridge piers, every 120 feet, 
Uh, there will be some encroachment of the pier into the alley, um, it'd be pr protected by bollards as well. So it, it, it all depends on the location. Okay, thanks Rob. So that was our final question. I'm gonna give it a few more minutes to let anyone who would like to ask a question. So go ahead and submit a question. Rob, when do you anticipate stage B starting? Um, about uh, spring of 23, I believe, is our current schedule. We do have a few more questions coming in. This question is for Tammy, will the recording of this meeting be available online? Yes, it will. It will be available, um, this recording of this English in English, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Spanish. Okay, I'm gonna give it a few more minutes. Um, it doesn't look like we're getting any more questions. So we are going to wrap up the Q&A session of this meeting. If you submitted a question or if you would like to submit questions later, you can send those questions to our email, transitchicago.com forward slash RPM. Again, all the questions will be posted to our website an email will be sent to all attendees with links to this presentation, a recording of the webinar, a list of all the questions, and a short survey. Again, the recording of this meeting will be translated into Chinese, Vietnamese, and Spanish, and will be posted to the RPM website. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a great evening. <laughs>